Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar all about low pressure sewer systems. I'm your host, Chris Nedwick with Environment One Corporation, and joining me today is Will Stradling from Secret Equipment Company. Will is a professional engineer and outside sales representative with Seward Equipment. Will, would you start by dealing with some housekeeping issues? Sure, thank you, Chris. Today's presentation is approved for one professional development hour. To receive credit, each participant must be registered. After the completion of this presentation, you will receive an evaluation survey that must be completed. There are 12 questions to fill out. No evaluation, no PDH credit. You can download the certificate of completion now on the GoToWebinar dashboard, print it, fill in your name, and retain a copy for your files. During the presentation, you can submit questions on the GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will do our best to answer them at the end. Just waiting for the screen to advance here, excuse me. You Every go, Thank you. Every Tuesday in April, Seaward Equipment is offering free webinars beginning at noon. Here is a list of upcoming topics. Please check your email, follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn for more details. Now back to you, Chris. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Having some issues advancing the slides here. Please bear with me. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Low pressure sewer systems offer the designer new freedom in solving. Chris, I'm sorry, um, we can't see anything on the screen. How about now? I know we just see the opening. Um, like you're you're waiting to share your screen. How about now? Nope. Here, let me pull it out and um, I'll make you presenter again. Hold on, just a second. Okay. Now try it again. There we go. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Low pressure sewer systems offer the designer new freedom in solving many problem situations that have defied reasonably economic solutions using the conventional approach. Each low pressure sewer system design should be considered on the basis of its own unique circumstances. On such a basis, a sound choice between gravity and low pressure sewer system systems can be made. General criteria aid the engineer in making a preliminary choice between several alternative systems, entirely low pressure, entirely gravity, entirely vacuum, or a combination of systems. In this presentation, these criteria are presented and intended to serve as a general guide. 
The final decision and design are the responsibility of the project consulting engineer, whose knowledge of local conditions, including construction costs, regulatory requirements, and the client's particular needs become vital to the preparation of the final design and specifications. Low pressure sewer systems have initial low front end costs compared to gravity systems, which have nearly all of the total investment allocated in the first stage. With a low pressure sewer system, grinder pump costs are incurred only as construction progresses. These costs will be deferred for many years in certain types of development programs. A low pressure sewer system is not subject to infiltration from groundwater or from surface stormwater entering through leaking pipe joints and manholes. With zero infiltration, treatment plants need not be sized to handle the peak flow rates caused by infiltration. Treatment efficiencies can be more consistent and treatment plan operating costs decrease. A low pressure sewer system may become the critical factor in determining whether marginal land can be economically developed. Many attractive sites have been considered unsuitable for development because of the excess of costs typically associated with conventional sewer systems, such as sites with hilly terrain, land with negligible slope, high water tables, poor percolation characteristics, rock, seasonal occupancy, or low population density. Many communities are planning to convert from septic tanks to central sewage collection and treatment systems to minimize health standards and or environmental deterioration. The major reduction in cost and the simplicity of the installation of a low pressure sewer system have strong appeal for such community improvement programs. Small diameter pipe <clears throat> pressure mains may be laid along existing roadways with minimum disruption to streets, sidewalks, lawns, driveways, and underground utilities. Surface restoration costs are similarly minimized. Sewage delivered to the treatment plant because it contains no infiltration is more uniform in strength. The volume is smaller and peaks are greatly reduced. In this presentation, we will evaluate low pressure sewer, gravity, and vacuum systems. So we wanted to start today with some myths and misconceptions. When comparing sewer technology, there are misconceptions that pressure systems are incredibly expensive to operate because of the number of grinder pumps versus a gravity sewer system with lift stations. Lift stations can be maintenance intensive, as we all know, and require daily inspection. Gravity sewers are also designed for a certain amount of I&I, &I, which adds to the treatment cost and more frequent equipment repair and or a place replacement. So some of the myths and misconceptions, again, myths and misconceptions related to these three different types of collection. Gravity, once installed, gravity sewers are free. Another misconception is no regular maintenance is required. No cost associated with transporting and treating inflow and infiltration. Again, we certainly know these to be myths. With vacuum sewers, it's a sealed system with no infiltration. Again, myths, simple to operate and troubleshoot. Another myth is that multiple homes can share a vacuum valve chamber. With pressure sewer systems, a myth and misconception, constant maintenance is required. This is not the case with pressure sewer and that it's expensive to operate. And that is certainly not the case with pressure sewer either. So where to use pressure sewers? Grinder pumps of approved design accomplish all pumping and sewage grinding processes for small diameter, uh, low pressure sewer systems or what we call LPS systems. <clears throat> Excuse me, the design consists of conventional drain, waste and vent or DWV piping within the residence connected to the grinder pump inlet. The grinder pump may be installed above or below grade indoors or outdoors, depending on inflow factors and model used, it may serve one or more residences or several families. In the case of apartment buildings, multi-use construction. Grinder pumps discharge a finely ground slurry into small diameter pressure piping. In a completely pressurized collection system, all the piping downstream from the grinder pump, including laterals and mains, will normally be under low pressure. Pipe sizes will start at one and one quarter inches for house connections compared to four or six inches in gravity systems and will be proportionally smaller than the equivalent gravity pipeline throughout the system. All pipes are arranged as zone networks without loops. Depending on topography, size of the system and planned rate of build out, appurtenances may include valve boxes, flushing arrangements, air release valves at significant high points, 
check valves and fully ported stops at the junction of each house connection with the low pressure sewer main. So typically we see low pressure sewer systems used in a variety of different types of act, uh, applications and conditions, certainly with undulating terrain where rocky soil conditions are prevalent, where there's high groundwater table, where the terrain is flat and in conjunction with existing sewage collection systems to expand the service area. So one of the things you'll hear a lot about in this presentation is how the small diameter nature of a low pressure sewer system uh, reduces significantly the amount of excavation and cost that is incurred with installation. Why is pressure sewer used? Wastewater is pumped up hills. There's no critical slope required. You can pump up hills, down hills, around things, under roadways with ease. The network is fully sealed. It's resistant to stormwater infiltration. Again, no critical slope is required, and we frequently see horizontal directional drilling methods utilized. Pump systems with positive pressure are common and more intuitive than vacuum or negative pressure systems. Therefore, technicians are more successful in diagnosing and correcting faults. Grinder pump stations provide a level of emergency storage in the event of a power outage or equipment fault. Grinder pumps and low pressure sewer systems actively process solids and debris with a grinder unlike a vacuum system which only use the force from differential air pressure. And again, folks, if you have any questions or comments as we proceed through the presentation, please utilize the chat feature and we'll answer them at the end. Low pressure sewer does not have any centralized critical infrastructure. A fault at one site will not affect the operation at other sites. This is an asymmetric design, again, unreliant upon one single source of infrastructure to function. Low pressure sewer sites can identify system abusers, debris or infiltration more effectively than vacuum or gravity, as we've mentioned. And again, pressure sewer systems have virtually zero stormwater infiltration. This produces a significant benefit on downstream infrastructure. We frequently receive questions about discharge locations. Often an engineer or other stakeholder uh, will have an existing application and they'll wanna know where can your system discharge to uh, appropriately and effectively? And the answer is there's several options available. We can discharge effectively to gravity manholes and the drawing that you see on the right would be considered a typical drop connection. Gravity force mains, gravity mains, wastewater treatment plants, lift station wet wells. We discharge to existing force mains, again, whether it's pressurized or not. Septic tanks, although not frequent, are certainly uh, a location we can discharge to. Treatment lagoons, on-site treatment systems when appropriate, larger or intermediate grinder pump stations, whether they be E1 or other. And there are cases where our pressure sewer systems have been utilized successfully with vacuum. Our approach is focused really in a nutshell on maintaining customer satisfaction and reliability through uh, keeping uh, operation and maintenance costs low. And the way that yeah, that is achieved is by offering interchangeable equipment, by ensuring that flows are predictable and consistent and that the system is what is called optimized. Low inlet velocities on the actual grinder to prevent clogging, and any downstream complications, we always want to ensure that any wastewater uh, that is entered into or pumped into a centralized system is a fine slurry and always a fine slurry. Simplicity of repair and or replacement is paramount. And design assistance, in this case, uh, design assistant, which is a program we offer. Uh, what I'll say for this presentation is that whoever you work with uh, on a potential low pressure sewer system, at the very least, ought to be able to provide free uh, design assistance port uh, to ensure that that system is being uh, designed properly and is going to operate optimally down the line and deliver reliability. We'll talk a little bit more about how we accomplish that here in the coming slides. 
application engineering is uh, really the first step, again, to ensuring that a system is reliable. Um, the way that it works is you would send an application engineer some basic uh, information to get the process started. Things like the layout of lots to be served by grinder pumps. Plats or topo maps are, are common. These days we get a lot of uh, Google Earth imagery, which aids in this. What are the potential flows expected with each connection or lot? The pipe type, often dictated by local regs and practices, but we'll, we'll wanna get a sense of what is the type material and, and that is gonna be used for this system because of the different performance characteristics each offers. Any topographical information is considered essential. What are the maximum elevations, the minimum elevations, things along that line. Discharge locations or end of the pressure system. What is the scope of the project? Also, where is it located and what are the froth depth requirements? Those can impact hydraulics, of course, and certainly performance. Are there any local code requirements that we need to be aware of? Any other relevant information regarding geography, flows, site conditions, requirements, et cetera. Again, whoever you're working with on designing a low pressure sewer system, really uh, it is, should be covering all of these aspects of each design upfront to ensure that the system is designed properly. We're frequently uh, presented with questions about system piping. What we recommend is it must be rated for a minimum of 200 PSI working pressure. Most commonly we see SDR 11, HDPE, and SDR 21 PVC. SCED 40 PVC, as long as it's pressure rated, I would add. SDR 26 PVC is also used. Standardized dimensions, and IPS. We always say avoid CTS, because it's not intended or optimal for the application. Laterals are typically one and one quarter inch, while force mains in the system are typically between two and four inches. Another area that we get a lot of questions about are air release valves or ARVs. What we recommend is changes that we utilize ARVs in applications where changes in elevation of 25 feet or more occur also at intervals between 2,000 and 2,500 linear feet on horizontal runs, even those that lack a clearly defined high point, and also high points followed by major downhill runs. We would also take this moment to stress that air release valves, once installed, do require uh, exercising or maintenance. So there should be a plan in place to deal with this uh, during the operation phase. One of the things that we offer is a life cycle cost analysis. Uh, we try to educate as much as possible so that engineers and stakeholders can make informed decisions about uh, what type of technology to use for a given application. So what is a life cycle cost analysis? It's, it's an economic analysis that utilizes engineering and financial inputs to compare alternatives. Most commonly we see gravity, low pressure sewer, and vacuum as part of the criteria. It evaluates all present and future costs necessary to construct, operate, and maintain a system. Provides a long-term assessment compared to evaluating only the initial capital cost. And what we do is we, we tailor these according to the needs of each individual stakeholder and client, and they can get uh, very in-depth or they can be high level. But again, the objective is to provide an analysis that assists and aids uh, engineers and stakeholders in making critical decisions about what type of collection uh, should be used or is preferred uh, for a given application. Data required and, and parameters that might be involved install capital costs, including rehabilitation and post inspection. Annual operation and maintenance costs are also covered. What is the post renewal infiltration and inflow? Also financial criteria, which is essential. Cost escalation rate is covered. Discount rate can be covered and project planning period is also covered. So we look at the given envelope of time that we're working with and provide uh, a, an appropriate study. And I'd like to add that uh, there are resources available. Uh, if anyone is interested in developing a life cycle cost analysis, uh, we can certainly talk about that offline or later. Operational parameters are also critical to this area. What is the cost to transport and treat I and I? Post rehabilitation, sewer inspection and cleaning, significant costs associated with this aspect of operation. We help understand what that might look like in a long-term context. 
Lift station and other component costs are also covered. And the planning period. Optimal planning period is between 20 and 40 years. We're often asked, yeah, how much does it cost to operate a low pressure sewer system? And we, we don't uh, necessarily share information that we have developed. We always look to end users or third parties to provide uh, their data uh, because it's, it's real world data, uh, it's impartial, and it tends to be the most accurate. And there's two examples here uh, of maintenance costs, annual maintenance costs for two low pressure sewer systems. One is in Jerusalem, New York, one is in Fairfield, Glade, Tennessee. As you can see in the case of Jerusalem, the average cost per pump, typically somewhere between the $20 and $40 range. There were some spikes incurred uh, during the years 2010 and 11 due to some uh, natural weather events and extended power outages, which had an impact on service rates. But you could still see that the average costs were quite low. And again, that's a, a third party analysis. That's third party data. And uh, we would certainly encourage uh, anyone to follow up on that case study to obtain more information. Also, Fairfield Glade, Tennessee, uh, this captured costs between the years 1996 and 2004. A little bit dated. Uh, again, it's not our, our study. It's, it's Fairfield Glade study. Uh, we can make more information available on this that's more up to date, but you see what the average costs uh, are there as well. And um, you know, we would consider this to be typical for any installation that is installed properly and designed properly. Designing pressure sewer systems is uh, really where it all begins. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we are able to design LPS systems uh, to utilize such small piping and to be so reliable. And you know, what is the basis of the design? Uh, there are two main bases out there, as, as we all know, the rational method for low pressure sewer system design and the probability method. Environment one, we utilize the probability method. And it really comes down to uh, sizing a system uh, with a sequence of zones in accordance with simultaneous operations. So uh, simultaneous operations or SIMOPS are the amount of pumps that will be operating at any given time in a given system. And this is based on uh, 50 years of uh, validated and revalidated data, empirical data about how these systems behave. It goes back to 1969 to what's called the Albany study, which is where this whole concept was born. Uh, it's an incredibly reliable way to design, and it has produced literally thousands of systems that operate predictably without issues. The table on the right, I want to just take a moment to address uh, because it contains uh, basic sequence and modeling uh, of this system. And um, you'll see on the left, we'll start there. That is the number of pumps in a zone. And on the right is the corresponding simultaneous operation. And you'll see in this particular system, it goes from one up to 1,004 connections. And we know, again, through 50 plus years of uh, revalidated empirical evidence from a design standpoint and analysis standpoint that at no given time should more than 35 pumps be operating simultaneously in that system. So that's how we can uh, create such incredibly uh, optimized and efficient systems that utilize such a small diameter pipe. We don't have to design for 1,004 houses. We have only have to design for 35 simultaneous operations. Septic tanks are uh, a big driver of, uh, you know, eliminating septic tanks are a big driver in, in, in why pressure sewer systems are utilized. And I think it makes sense to talk a little bit about some of the downsides. We all know from reading uh, recent newspaper articles and uh, trade journals that failing septic tanks are, are a significant problem in the United States and beyond. They have a costly life cycle require maintenance uh, and if they're not maintained properly they're probably not working properly there's initial installation and an existing soil condition requirement uh, there can be odors if the system is not optimized there could be home site depreciation several safety factors are associated with septic tank failure included but not limited to failing septic tanks causing algal blooms and water pollution and there have even been cases of private drinking wells that are contaminated as a result of septic tanks not working properly. These pose a significant public health issue due to pathogens that can leach out into the surrounding environment. Natural water resources are commonly polluted by failing tanks. 
leaking septic tanks may be unacceptably noxious and collapsed tanks are a hazard. When we're talking to engineers and stakeholders about pressure sewer, initially there's some questions about, you know, what does the installation look like? So I wanted to transition to um, a side view of a typical installation. And this shows on the right side, a home with an alarm panel. And I would just say that we, as far as our electrical requirements are concerned, uh, what we need uh, for an E1 system is single phase 240 volt power. We're looking for a single dedicated 30 amp breaker inside the house. And if you have those things and you have sufficient power, you have uh, what's required to run a typical uh, E1 system or grinder pump system. I want to point out the conduit that connects the alarm panel to the actual tank structure. Typically, uh, we are going to, well, we always recommend that um, conduit be used, but our cable is uh, direct barrier rated. Beneath that, you can see a four inch inlet connection, which goes from the house to the station itself. Um, just to explain the process of how this works, as the wastewater enters the system, the tank level rises. As it gets to a certain point, it will activate an on off switch. If that level were to continue to rise, it would activate an alarm switch eventually. Alarms are incredibly infrequent, and we know, again, through third party data that uh, at least on one of our systems, the mean time between service calls is about once per decade. The asset is designed to last 25 plus years. Exiting the tank is a inch and a quarter discharge, which connects to a stainless steel unilateral or curb stop. And that is typically the demarcation point between private and public lands. I don't wanna forget about the ballast that is shown underneath the tank itself. We do recommend ballasting and prepackaged ballast systems are available. Exiting the stainless steel unilateral, you'll see the connection at the street with a low pressure sewer system force main, again, installed below a minimum frost depth. And those can be accomplished, those taps uh, can be accomplished in a variety of ways. Typically we see saddle tap methods used. So whatever type of pressure sewer system you're considering, um, it's recommended that you look for ease of installation uh, as part of your criteria. The reason for this is ease of installation eventually translates to reliability. We know that systems that are installed properly where there's less opportunity for uh, the human factor uh, to complicate things, uh, deliver more reliable service life. Always, always look for a system that is factory assembled and tested, complete with a basin, pump, core, tray cable, check valve, everything, all appurtenances included in one package. Field adjustable basin heights are essential because Oftentimes, there are variables that are encountered on any construction project, and maybe the tank needs to be a little bit taller than originally anticipated, or maybe it needs to be shorter. And uh, that being the case, field adjustable basin height capability becomes crucial. Double wall basin construction is a sound engineering practice, simply due to the fact that it is uh, you have a redundancy, and that equates to uh, more safety. Serviceability is uh, critical, a critical consideration with low pressure sewer systems. Core versus individual components is also a very significant area to consider. You, you don't want to necessarily have uh, a grinder pump system that shows up on the job site in 10 different boxes and has to be assembled on site. Again, where you, where you have on site assembly, you have the opportunity for human error, uh, if the opportunity to cut corners. And you know these are things that we, we should always strive to eliminate. So plug and play, factory tested, uh, ready on site for the contractor to quickly and easily install is again, critical. Electrical quick disconnects can eliminate junction boxes. Again, eliminating uh, excessive service costs. Stainless steel discharge components equate to longer service life and uh, more reliability. And alarm boxes versus control panels. We get this question pretty frequently. Um, with our particular system, we house the controls in the pump as opposed to inside the panel far away from the motor. Um, climate control uh, becomes uh, uh, very important when it comes to motor reliability. Uh, heat 
and, and cold and excessive uh, variations in temperatures are the enemy of electrical components, certainly capacitors. And um, if those are up in the panel and they're subject to extreme heat, that will certainly depreciate uh, the expected lifespan and reliability of that component. So we put everything inside the tank where it's A, uh, in a climate controlled environment and B, uh, close to the motor. So it reduces the uh, possibility of voltage drop. Often forgotten uh, in the discussion about pressure sewer systems, I guess once upon a time more so than these days, uh, are unilaterals or laterals, which is uh, really the connection point between the station that's located on private property and uh, the, the public uh, infrastructure out in the street, in this case, the, uh, the piping network. Stainless steel unilaterals are now available, which uh, really are uh, a game changer in, in this world of, of, of laterals. They offer ball valves for isolation of grinder pump lateral from the force main in one assembly. Also a check valve to prevent backflow and a clean out port. The ones that we produce are made from 316 stainless steel construction, which is a very durable alloy suited for multiple applications. They're rated to work at a pressure of up to 235 PSI. So the working pressure that these things are rated to is significant. It's designed specifically for use in pressure sewer systems utilizing grinder pumps. And in our case, it's required with every E1 station. 100% factory tested before it arrives on the job site. So what are the typical grinder pump specifications? One horsepower single phase motor, large diameter, hardened grinding device. Grinding performance is independently certified from ANSI 46. High head capabilities are essential. And the reason for this is because in any pressure sewer system, you're going to have varying conditions based on peak flows and other factors. So at two main street, your average pressure throughout the day may be five horsepower, but at 120 main street, it might be somewhere up around uh, 50 PSI. So you wanna have a grinder pump that's gonna work uh, in both locations. This is where having a high head capability becomes essential. Integrated pressure switches are uh, preferred because they don't come in contact with wastewater and they deliver years of reliable, simple, predictable performance. They require no preventative maintenance, again, because they're not in the wastewater inside the tank coming in contact with things like fats, oils, greases, and wipes. Interchangeability is critical. You don't want to have uh, a variety of different parts on the shelf and uh, folks showing up, uh, service folks showing up to work on a pump and not know what they're going to encounter. So you want to make sure all, whatever system you have, everything is integrated and interchangeable and standardized. A design life of 25 plus years uh, should be at a minimum the requirement. And we know from speaking to customers that the average mean time between service calls for any one system is about 10 years. We wanted to talk a little bit about some of the hydraulics. And the difference is really, there's, there's two main types of pumps out there. There's progressing cavity design pumps and there's centrifugal pumps. So this slide is somewhat busy, but it, it, it encapsulates the difference between the two uh, and, and relates it to what is called a, a typical system curve. So we'll start on the left. If you'll notice uh, the system curve, it's the blue vertical line, which goes from about zero up to 185 feet uh, of total dynamic head. And if you can look over to the right of the y-axis, you'll see the blue curve, which would be indicative of an SPD pump curve. And that's very uh, similar or symmetrical to that system curve that we see. So in a nutshell, that means basically, uh, no matter where you are in that system curve, up to a point, the SPD pump is going to be able to turn on and do its job and overcome force main pressure. Conversely, a centrifugal pump curve looks markedly different. Um, you know, centrifugal pumps are, are, are great. You know, I'm not gonna sit here and say anything bad about them, neither is anyone else. Uh, but um, what we have seen over the years is that they're not uh, ideal for pressure sewer applications because they're either way off to the right or they're way to the left of the curve, uh, way off that, that, that optimal duty point. And that can lead to things like cavitation and motor overload. So again, in a nutshell here, uh, you wanna make sure that you're utilizing a pump with a performance curve 
uh, that is more vertical and is going to overcome force main pressure in a variety of different conditions. Again, in comparing the different types of designs, uh, SPD pumps versus centrifugals, with a semi-positive displacement pump, you have a stator and a rotor, which is based on the Moigno principle going back several hundred years, but it's basically forcing water to move uh, out the discharge uh, through a sequence of uh, semi-positive displacement chambers that's actually forcing water in one direction. With a centrifugal pump, you have an impeller design, which creates a vortex, and that vortex ex exits discharge location. Good for high flow situations, uh, not always uh, where you have varying uh, system uh, pressures and flow rates. Semi-positive displacement pumps utilize low velocity design with high torque as opposed to high velocity and low torque. That means that the grinder design is going to be uh, reliable and is going to perform in accordance with expectations. Basically equates to less jams and less clogging. Large diameter grinders are what we see on SPD pumps typically, as opposed to small diameter cutters on centrifugal pumps. Internal controls are utilized uh, with, certainly with E1 SPD pumps, as opposed to external flow controls on uh, some of the centrifugal products that are out there. The simplified design again becomes uh, a very, very critical consideration from a service and operation standpoint. A lot of times with some of the uh, more wholesale products that we see out there on the market, uh, there's a lot of what we would consider unnecessary infrastructure on the inside of that tank, rail systems that can corrode, float trees, float controls that come in contact with wastewater, junction boxes, lift out chains. These are all things that uh, should be avoided. Virtually all the centrifugal pumps utilized for low pressure sewer applications that we're aware of utilize oil filled motors. This is uh, dielectric oil. Typically, it requires a service and uh, you know requires proper handling and disposal. This is something that is often not considered uh, up front, which should be. When you have a small inlet, as you see with most centrifugal pump designs, you have uh, solids buildup, which leads to increased service rates and more costs. Where you have floats, you have uh, sometimes preventative maintenance, but certainly higher frequency of maintenance, uh, just by virtue of the fact that that float control is coming in contact with fats, oil, greases, and wipes, uh, which over time build up and eventually interfere with the op operation of that control. And junction boxes are, are you know, for low pressure sewer systems uh, are uh, problematic because, uh, you know, it's, it's not a quick and easy uh, method of connecting power. And, um, you know, you may have screws or bolts to manipulate. A service call might take place in the middle of the night, uh, for example, which would make it uh, even more difficult. Uh, look for a design that's going to make that uh, process uh, easy, safe, and simple. Separate pump level and motor controls can make service more complicated and time-consuming, and they may require larger horsepower to overcome varying head conditions. If you will just refer back to that slide I showed previously about how uh, this can often be the case. When evaluating a pressure sewer solution. Um, we recommend that you take time to think about monitoring and protection. And there are panel options available that uh, can protect the asset from everything, uh, a wide range of potential conditions and parameters, uh, everything from uh, low power or uh, incomplete or poor power to high pressure. And these are built into the panel itself and uh, you know, are really, really uh, kind of the next level of asset protection and can often lead to significant uh, service reductions and, and costs as a result. Also, with pressure sewer systems utilized really in any application, but we see uh, the, the lion's share of the applications that we see are residential, we try to take the homeowner out of the equation, and the way that that is achieved is through uh, remote monitoring uh, of the system itself. So, Think of it as a uh, really just a, a, an alarm system that is uh, detected uh, via telemetry to a remote service entity. So in real world language, what that means is if there is a service call, 
the service technician uh, would be aware of that call via a remote alarm. And what we find often before the homeowner even knows there's an issue and they can be dispatched almost immediately and show up and deal with uh, potential problems uh, that are small before they become more significant. So we want to make that service process streamlined. We want to make it efficient. We want to make uh, communication really front and center uh, with everything that occurs. And, you know, the better job you do planning up front um, from a, a telemetry and protection and monitoring standpoint, uh, the better that system is going to perform in the long haul. Excuse me. Product validation and testing uh, really is something that uh, design engineers and stakeholders should be investigating and looking at when uh, determining a, a, a potential provider for a pressure sewer system. Um, engineering labs where destructive testing occurs is uh, really uh, should be part of the discussion. You know, ask uh, ask people, uh, ask folks who are offering uh, solutions. You know, what is the destructive testing like for that that product? Uh, what are the uh, life cycle capabilities at the facility? And what are you doing to continually improve your product to increase reliability so that whatever uh, you folks specify is going to perform optimally and deliver the most value for your customers and clients? Environment One is the only company that we're aware of presently that has uh, NSF 46-97 third-party uh, testing certification. And this is a random test that's performed uh, annually. And uh, you can see there is a wide range of different uh, potential failure modes uh, and items that are introduced with a given frequency. And basically, what we're doing here is trying to see just how tough the pump is and ensure that it's going to operate reliably and predictably uh, in a number of uh, different potential scenarios. Everything from excessive toilet tissue to facial tissue, cigarette tips, as you can read, eggs, paper towels, so on and so forth all the way down to uh, toy cars and uh, things like that. So uh, again, we, we do meet this criteria and uh, we have uh, for a very long period of time now. We included uh, some questions and answers as we come to uh, the end of our webinar that really have come up from other webinars and other uh, brown bag functions that we've done throughout the United States. We thought we'd just throw some of them out there. Um, to kind of stimulate your your thoughts and uh, kind of get you thinking more, uh, you know, critically about this application. Um, one of the questions was, how long have low pressure sewers been utilized in the United States? And you know, really, in the case of E1, it goes back to 1969 and to 1970. But the concept was really born in the mid 50s, uh, really gained traction in the mid 60s, and went into the implementation phase uh, in Albany, New York, back in uh, about midway through 1969. So we know through 50 plus years now of experience, um, you know, what these systems, uh, how they should be designed, uh, not only from a hydraulic standpoint, but also from an engineering standpoint and how they're going to behave and, and what are some of the best practices that can help uh, uh, achieve uh, a long uh, service life. When should you consider pressure sewers is a very frequent question. And, you know, the answer to that is wherever uh, from a flow standpoint, uh, it's appropriate. We, more times than not, uh, pressure sewer should be uh, considered as a potential solution for a wastewater application. As a, a matter of due diligence, uh, we believe it makes sense to to evaluate it. And again, I would draw your attention to the the cost calculator that uh, that we offer that can help empower some of those decisions. But really, any place where it's appropriate, it's an appropriate technology. We're past the alternative technology phase. Again, 50 plus years in doing this, uh, you know. 700,000 plus systems out there, uh, you know, a couple million end users every day. Uh, you know, we're, we're past the alternative phase. We're now at an appropriate phase. So the answer is consider it uh, wherever it's appropriate. What are some of the advantages of low pressure sewer systems? Well, again, you know, it has a light touch on the landscape by utilizing a small diameter pipe network. Uh, you can achieve significant upfront cost reductions. And we know again, through that third party data that it's a very efficient system to operate. Um, not uncommon to see average costs, including electrical consumption, to be somewhere in the $30 to $40 range. True or false, the cost of energy should be a major concern to a homeowner. That's 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 false. Um, energy concerns should always be top of mind. We should always try to be e efficient and we should always conserve. But the reality is with a single horsepower progressing cavity pump, the electrical 
electrical consumption, excuse me, is roughly equivalent to a 40 watt light bulb. So, um, you know, with average flows, <clears throat> Um, with our standard simplex unit, um, about 700 gallons a day is what it's designed up to. You know, you're, that pump's only going to be running for several minutes a day, uh, again, consuming the equivalent of a 40-watt light bulb. So uh, depending on where you are in the country, it's, you know, you're going to be looking at energy costs of probably somewhere, um, well, again, depending on where you are, but, you know, we have uh, heard from customers that uh, have said that the power consumption cost is somewhere in the $20, $20 range. True or false, the individual pumps rely on each other to move sewage to the discharge point. That's false. Again, it's an asymmetric uh, form of collection conveyance. It does not rely on a single uh, piece of infrastructure to function. And oftentimes uh, when there's a power outage of any type, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, the system can turn back on incrementally. And uh, there have been cases uh, as was the case uh, documented down in the Florida Keys uh, after a hurricane uh, a couple of years ago, and we can provide more information on this separately. We'd be happy to do so, where uh, it was proven that the pressure sewer system uh, was restored quicker in some cases than the gravity system because wherever you can turn the power back on, you're turning your sewer down on as well simultaneously. Due to very variable flow rates at different times of the day, pipe sizing is important. Most systems designed today use which method of pipe sizing? Well, for in our case, we use uh, the probability method to design, um, but certainly flow rates do differ. And uh, again, that's why we encourage folks to use, uh, and pressures differ. That's why we encourage folks to use uh, SPD pumps. Another question that comes up pretty frequently is, will an SPD pump burst my pump, my pipes, excuse me, due to blockages and high pressure? And the answer to that is it, it will not, because it won't exceed the uh, max rating operating pressure of, uh, of a, the pipe that you have in your system, number one. Number two, there shouldn't be any blockages. If it's utilizing a low uh, speed, high torque grinder the design that's not reliant upon sharpness, as is the case with an SPD pump, the only wastewater that's going to get introduced into that system is going to be a fine slurry. Another question, what happens when the power goes out? Well, this is a very frequent question. Um, we have a couple days of storage available with our tanks, uh, a couple days or more storage when it comes to our tanks. Uh, we try to walk stakeholders around the wheel on this and you know just put things in proper context. In most cases, when the power goes out, you're not using your dishwasher and your washing machine. Uh, you're probably not using the shower as much or, or other appliances that uh, consume water and introduce water into the system. Um, but we, uh, we, we, we don't see this as uh, something that comes up and causes problems. Not a major concern uh, from our standpoint. Uh, these are very reliable systems that are able to deliver uh, the homeowner through that period uh, of, of power outage. Um, the average uh, time duration of a power outage in this country is uh, now less than 10 minutes. Can low pressure sewer be used with other types of collection? Example, gravity. Absolutely. We tell engineers all the time it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. Look at pressure sewer uh, as an appropriate technology to be used to supplement your toolbox as you are developing solutions for your customers. Uh, it can be used in conjunction with gravity with, with no issues as long as uh, the, the pressures, uh, for example, if there was a, a force main uh, were appropriate and applicable, uh, as long as uh, our pump can overcome force main pressure, absolutely, it can be used. It is used significantly with uh, gravity systems and other types of systems as well. And this also helps engineers uh, bring uh, projects within budget. Uh, they may determine that um, to sewer an entire project with gravity only is going to become cost prohibitive. So what we're seeing now are more engineers kind of shaving off pieces of that gravity system, turning them into LPS, reducing the cost and bringing that project uh, into uh, budget. So very uh, adaptable uh, technology that should be utilized in the majority of cases. So with that being said, I would like to uh, thank you all once again for your time. Uh, really appreciate you sitting through our webinar and hopefully you learned uh, some valuable information today. And I'll turn it back over to Sherry and Will or any of the questions that have uh, come up throughout the presentation. Thank you, Chris, and great job. And thank you all for spending some time with us today. I uh, don't see any questions.
on the oh well there there's a bunch of questions okay um okay does change in pressure realized in the system when interfacing with gravity sewer or traditional force main have an adverse impact on low pressure sewers Willie, do you want to answer that or do you i, I will i didn't know how you yeah go ahead it. yeah so if i understand the question right is it you know will changes in the pressure impact absolutely that's why um you know we're not going to sit here and tell you that uh you know our pump for example is going to work 100 percent of the time it's going to work probably in the vast majority of cases but we're, we're going to want to work with you the design engineer uh and understanding what those pressures might be before we sign off on anything so um yeah it, it your question is valid there could be cases where it doesn't work again we see the vast majority of times that it it, it is appropriate for our technology to be utilized in. But if you know, for example, that the, the pressure inside that force main gets up to 200 PSI, we're probably gonna uh, uh, say, you know, well, let's, let's slow down a little bit here. This doesn't seem like it's a good fit. But we'll, we'll work with you on, on that. We really try to dive into individual applications to understand them uh, from the ground up uh, as the trusted advisor. Next question, please. Okay. Um, do you have any engineer reports by a consultant that highlight the benefits and reduced costs of low pressure pipe over gravity. It would be interesting to see an entire report with the life cycle cost analysis from a consultant. Yeah, we, we do have uh, information uh, like that. I would encourage, and I can't see, forgive me, I can't see who's asking the question, so I don't, I can't follow up with oh. you directly. But uh, if we could just get the name and, and contact info from that person, we'll put you in touch with some folks who can uh, produce that. We, we have one, um, a voluminous, uh, expansive, uh, uh, you know, information related to case studies uh, of this nature. So, um, I'm very confident that we can get you what you need to uh, help you with your uh, decision-making process there. Okay. Um, how well do the grinder pumps handle foreign objects like washcloths? Well, you know, washcloth would be considered a prohibited item. Uh, that's the easy answer. It shouldn't be in the tank, right? But we all know that in real world situations, uh, everything finds its way into a sewer system. That's why uh, back trucks get clogged up with bowling balls, for example, which has actually been documented. Um, you know, our pump will be able to deal with it. Um, it might take a couple of days, but a washcloth is not gonna jam an E1 grinder. It would jam a centrifugal pump because it's going to be uh, uh, operating at a very high, uh, RPM with uh, a very low torque capability. And then especially if it's uh, been in existence and been in use for a couple of years and the knives are dull, um, that, that's gonna be problematic. Where, where, where we see issues are with flushable wipes. Um, you know, flushable wipes are a problem for every pump design under the sun. <clears throat> Everything from, uh, you know, an E1 pump, for example, to a $100,000 lift station is experiencing issues with flushable wipes. But with, with, with uh, low, speed high torque grinder um, like we utilize that doesn't require sharpness we have the most forgiving design uh, when it comes to that type of thing so washcloths shouldn't be an issue um, if it's 100 washcloths in two days that might be a different story but that would be considered very rare okay the next question is um this has a lot of questions within one so i'll start out with the first one how do you pull the pump out? Okay, you pull the pump out. Um, well, I can only speak to our pump, but you pull the pump out by unlocking the latch with a core wrench that is provided with each station, conceivably would be on the service truck. You would then use that same core wrench to open the valve, and then you would take the lifting rope, which is located inside of the station. It hangs from the top, very cleanly, very accessible and you pull the asset out. Excuse me, I forgot one step. You would disconnect the electrical uh, quick disconnect, which replaces a junction box, and uh, that electrical connection is accomplished with uh, really about three quarters of one turn of a NEMA 6P rated electrical connection. So very, very simple. As a former service person, I can tell you it takes about uh, you know, two minutes to pull any one pump out, if that. Okay, how do you add links to the wet well and maintain the double wall? We accomplish that uh, through really an extension. So really one of two ways. Um, I'll start with a simple way. 
we have a riser which just bolts to the top of the tank itself, which can give you an extra six inches, which more times than not is uh, all that's required to get that, that asset uh, up to an acceptable level. That's really to get it above an inflow point if it's too low. But if you really need uh, some more depth to that station, we offer a slip-on uh, station cover that uh, can be installed with a band clamp, stainless steel band clamp in the field. Um, I think we can get you up to like three or four additional feet uh, with those things. Um, that's a little bit more involved, but let's say uh, your contractor ordered the wrong thing and you know, you're two feet off from your inlet connection or you ran into uh, you know, some type of site condition which made you kind of relocate that asset further away than you initially planned. Um, that's a, a very low cost uh, option that's available and um, you know, can be installed in a couple hours. And you know, is, the feedback from the field is that it, it, it works very well, it's reliable. It is double wall, um, but it also has a kind of a transition point on the bottom, the, the slip on portion uh, of the design. Okay, um, how do you, oh, sorry, next question. Um, what is the electrical area hazard classification of the wet well? Um, can you repeat the question? What is electrical area hazard classification of the wet well? I don't have that information off the top of my head, but I'd like to follow up uh, with that individual, Sherry. Uh, we'll, Not a problem. We'll get, we'll get that information to them uh, within a day. Okay. Um, what is the min-max burial depth of the wet well? Or are there a bunch of off-the-shelf ranges and lengths? So for the wet well, we get you up to about 200 inches. Um, we can get you, I believe, to an invert depth of around 165 inches, which is pretty tall. Um, that's what with a standard selection, and that's uh, appropriate in the, the vast majority of cases. Um, so, uh, you know, we do recommend that you contact the factory. If you've got something that deep, we're going to want to know a few things about it, just to ensure that it's going to perform um, adequately in the field. But we'll, we'll get you uh, right up around 200 inches if we need to. That's for total station height, not 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 invert. Which again, I think max invert depth on uh, a poly tank is somewhere in the 160 inch range. Um, what is the load rating of the cover? Don't have that off the top of my head in terms of the exact. I mean, it is load rated. Um, I'd like to. Just jot that one down to Sherry if it's okay so we can follow up with that individual. I know from a destructive testing standpoint, um, you know, it's 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 not traffic rated, um, but we did park a Suburban on them when we tested our new cover. Um, don't recommend that anybody do that, but I get the specifics uh, uh, to whoever answered that, excuse me, asked that question so that they can have it for their information. Okay. Not, not H20, um, not H20 though. Are you willing to share? Uh, they want to know if um, we can share the the presentation with the attendees. I'm sorry. Uh, they're asking if we can share the presentation with the attendees. Yes, we certainly don't have an issue with that. Okay. Um, do you have any applications or experience with these pumping from a landfill? Um, specifically, I don't have any knowledge of one pumping from a landfill. Um, if it's a bathroom at a landfill, then it should just be viewed as uh, whatever the wastewater application is. I don't, I'm not aware of any um, specific re requirements. If it's a, if it's an explosion proof uh, consideration, yes, we, we, we do offer explosion proof uh, rated pumps. Uh, and those are pretty common uh, for us. Um, so if it is a, a hazardous application concern, um, we certainly can, uh, you know, more times than not, uh, serve those applications with no issues. Okay. And do main lines need flushing? Uh, we recommend that lines uh, are equipped so that they can be flushed in, in, in the event that they need to be. Um, if you're, if you have an E1 system, for example, uh, with a ProCap pump and it's designed and it's optimized, uh, the velocities inside that force main sh should be such that it itself scours. So that means that there's no uh, solid buildup because uh, that that line is sized in such a way that it's achieving at least two feet per second velocity. 
Um, however, you know, if it's a seasonal application, let's say, and this really goes to um, the adaptability of the technology. Uh, let's say it's a builder developer and, you know, they, they're going to build 100 houses, but, uh, you know, they're probably only going to sell, you know, 15 to 20 in the first two years for whatever reason. And I'm just using this as a hypothetical. Um, well, then that's, that line needs to be built uh, for 100 houses eventually, but uh, might be a little bit oversized when there's only, uh, you know, three or four sim ops going into it for a couple of years. So that's a case where we we might tell you, again, based on the application that it would make sense uh, to, to flush those lines out. And um, you can do those with uh, terminal connections. You can do those with uh, flushing connections. There's con combined connections that can be installed on force mains for that purpose. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the lines may have to be flushed at some point. That is uh, absolutely uh, not the norm. But uh, it's a sound engineering practice to equip that line with uh, adequate flushing connections so that it can be if it needs to be. Okay. We have um, a lot more questions, but it's one o'clock. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to forward these questions on directly to Chris and Will, and he can respond back to you guys um, separately if that works for Chris and Will. Yeah, I'd, I'd be very happy to get back to everybody. Okay, good. I have um, I have all the information, so um, I will get you guys all that. That's fantastic. And I just, if I could, just uh, my closing remarks are, you know, thanks everyone. It's it's great to get, uh, you know, to interface with people, um, you know, during these times and still focus on our work. Again, hopefully, uh, you gain some useful information. Um, you know, we're certainly here to help you and support you uh, with whatever uh, applications you might be looking at. And we thank you all once again. Stay safe, and uh, we hope to be in touch. Thank you. And I just want to add, you will receive a link for your evaluation survey, and remember to download your certificate of completion. So thank you all again, and please do not hesitate to email or call if you need any more additional information. Thank you. Thank you.